All right. Hey, folks. Um, we're just missing our moderator, Alan Hunt. I just uh, emailed him the link, so hopefully he'll be joining us shortly. Everyone can see my screen with the slide? Okay, excellent. All right, folks, we'll just give um, folks another 30 seconds or a minute or so to hop on. Here comes Alan, so good timing. <laughs> All right, submitting the last stragglers in the waiting room now. Just give me a second. All right, I don't know if things happen. All right, so welcome to the Partnership Wild and Scenic River designation session, everyone. My name is Sandra Miola. I'm the director of the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, this session will be recorded and will be posted to the coalition's website early next week. Um, all attendees will be muted unless you are speaking, um, so just be mindful of that, the mute feature. Um, please use the chat box feature. Feel free to send in questions, comments, um, anything at all within that chat box throughout the next hour and a half or so. Um, if you have any uh, technical difficulties, feel free to use the chat box and directly chat me, and I'll do my best to, to help you out. And lastly, the forum, the rest of the forum schedule can be found on sketch.com. Uh, I'll put in a, a link to sketch into the chat box for your convenience. Um, and now I will turn it over to Alan Hunt, uh, our moderator for this session to take it from here. Alan, um, turn it over to you and just tell me when you want to advance slides. Hmm. We'll be good to go. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're glad to have you at this virtual forum. Uh, I am uh, the Director of Policy and Grants of the Musconetcom Watershed Association. We're in northwestern New Jersey in the Delaware River Basin. And we were going to ask each of our uh, speakers today to introduce themselves. So Sarah, would you introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everybody. Thrilled to be with you all here today. My name is Sarah Bursky, uh, pronouns she and her. And um, I am with the National Park Service Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers Program, specifically working with the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic and the White Clay Creek Wild and Scenic River. Thanks, Sarah. Mark Zakukansky. I'm the Director of Conservation Policy Engagement for the Appalachian Mountain Club. And I served as the President of the Board of the Delaware River Greenway Partnership for a number of years, where I currently serve as the Treasurer. Uh, glad to be here today. And I just had my camera not working, and I was able to get it up, so it's good to see you all. And uh, you probably saw the photo of me and my three-year-old son. Uh, we enjoy the Delaware River all the time together. Thanks so much. Patty? Thanks, Mark. So I'm Patty Ruby. I'm the Executive Director of Hunterd and Land Trust. We work in the Hunterdon County region of New Jersey, so sort of central Northwest New Jersey. And I'm also a member of the steering committee for the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic. Next slide. <clears throat> Great. So our goals today are to uh, introduce wild and scenic rivers and also go a little bit deeper into the role of the management council into how they're managed. We're gonna be sharing some information about uh, where the 
rivers are designated wild and scenic and also the eligible sections. I'll be starting off with that. And we're hoping that you'll find ways to work with the different wild and scenic rivers in your region. Uh, and also make sure that we have enough room for questions. So we're actually going to have two question breakpoints. We wanted to start off with a poll to get people's uh, interests and basic level of understanding about wild scenic rivers. We'll give you uh, how long, Sandra, for this? Uh, maybe 20 seconds or so. So folks, if you can see, if you can't see it on your screen, um, hopefully you do, but just in case, so you're in the loop, it says how aware of you are of the Wild and Scenic Rivers program on a scale of one to 10, one being I know nothing at all, 10 being I'm practically an expert. I think we have about half of folks here who have voted. I'll just give folks another couple seconds. Okay. Great. So you can probably see the poll results on your screen. A uh, wide range of, of knowledge about the wild and scenic rivers. Uh, it seems like a lot of folks are close to the lower Delaware, about half, that's great. And you're definitely in the right session about that. Uh, and we have a number of folks on the other parts of the main stem Delaware, middle and upper, and uh, some familiarity with a couple of the larger tributaries like the Musconet Gone. And we see a lot of you are interested in helping to designate new wild and scenic rivers. So we'll uh, kick right off there with indicating uh, where these rivers are and where uh, some of the eligible segments are. So the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act comes about in 1968 after a long period of policy in our country to uh, build dams uh, for a variety of reasons. Some of these are for flood control, some are for water supply projects, especially out in the west. Uh, the upper Delaware has water supply uh, projects that were built. And the idea at the time was that there should be a complementary policy to protect rivers that are free flowing. So no dams was one of the key things in this policy. Uh, the Delaware River is one of the longest free flowing rivers in the country, certainly in the east. And there's certain levels of free flowing uh, that are kind of discussed in the Wild Scenic River Act. There's wild, which is undeveloped, scenic, that's mostly natural, and a number of the rivers in our watershed that are designated wild and scenic have this characteristic, and recreational, limited development. So some buildings along the shoreline, but not, you know, very urban. Uh, so I, that's another characteristic that most of the wild scenic rivers have here, too. And just a couple of seconds questions that are relevant to our discussion today. And it's important to understand the Wild Scenic River Act. It's a little bit different than the Clean Water Act. It predates it, and it has some different ideas in it than, say, the Clean Water Act does. So I already mentioned the idea of free-flowing, but there's also this idea of outstandingly remarkable values. Other things that aren't just about the water itself, that perhaps there's scenic characteristics that you can see from the water, um, like the Milford Bluffs along the Delaware of the Lower Delaware River, and it has recreational uses or perhaps unique geology and also cultural and historic resources. Usually, like in the Clean Water Act, cultural and historic doesn't have much purchase in it, and that's something that really makes this act different and has a different approach in water quality protection. Section 7 is where there's a federal review of the uh, protection of the river for free flowing as well as other values. And that's something that Sarah will talk about, the National Park Service role in our rivers about that. Section 10 protects a lot of those aesthetic values mentioned in the earlier sections. So if your river has historic resources and there's a development proposed that might affect those, this is a section that would be used to review applications, uh, development applications. You can have cooperative agreements. So that's how we can have partnership rivers like Musconetcon or Lower Delaware have nonprofits engage in their river management. And then there's this one section about water quality 
which is a true anti-degradation standard. And you have to remember, it predates the uh, Clean Water Act, and it requires the federal agency, in our case, the National Park Service, to work with the state agency to eliminate and diminish pollution on that designated wild and scenic river. Um, these sections 7, 10, and 12 each have a federal role and do have some teeth with regard to how the river is protected. But other parts on a partnership river will acquire the role of partners, which we'll discuss uh, with the Lower Delaware. So here's where those designated rivers are in the Delaware watershed. We have the Upper Delaware, and that's federally administered, the Delaware Water Gap federally administered. We have the Lower Delaware and the Musconetcon, the White Clay Creek, and the entire watershed, the White Clay Clay, Clay Creek, it's very large, 199 miles, and the Maris, Maris River. So those are three, uh, sorry, four partnership rivers there. We can move on. And then there's also a provision in the Wild Scenic Rivers Act where Congress required the identification of eligible rivers. So these may not be the only eligible rivers in the watershed, but they're the ones that were identified on the National Rivers Inventory. And for example, the Musconetcon was not part of the National Rivers Inventory, but it was found to have eligible characteristics. So on this map, it is too much information. And that's part of the point here. We wanted folks to see that there's quite a number of eligible rivers in the watershed. Uh, up in the upper watershed, um, some really cool rivers like the Beaverkill and also the East Branch of the Delaware, we have some parts more in the middle watershed, like the Lehigh River or the French Creek or the Wissahickon. And then when you get down to the Delaware Bay, there is about almost 300 miles of eligible rivers. Wouldn't it be pretty amazing to think about a wild scenic river preserving that much of our tidal rivers in this basin? Next, please. And for a number of years, uh, the Coalition for Delaware River Watershed has had a priority, a policy priority for the wild scenic rivers. So initially, this was around the, fund, the federal funding for the partnership wild and scenic rivers. And we've been very fortunate in that the requests that have gone into Congress for funding for those rivers has been met by Congress. And currently in the House Appropriations Bill, we're looking at the highest funding level for those partnership rivers ever. And we're hoping the Senate matches that as well. We're also trying to look at ways where the partnerships can be formed with the other designated rivers and the federal, uh, federally managed ones, as well as supporting the eligible rivers and providing information for those to be designated. So we're glad you're here to learn more about that. Next. So I'm going to turn it over now to Sarah, who's at the National Park Service, and I'll talk about the wild scenic rivers from her perspective. Thanks, Alan, and thanks, Sandra, and thanks to all of you for joining us here today. Um, you know, part of our goal here as a panel in talking about wild and scenic rivers was to leave a lot of time for questions and discussion. So Alan and I are kicking it off. I'm just going to say a few words from the NPS perspective, and then we'll have some time for questions and discussion before I hand it over to my colleague, Mark, to continue the presentation. So um, because the focus is on partnership rivers, you won't hear too much from me today. Um, but I did want to give you a sense of the viewpoint here from the National Park Service seat with our partnership rivers. Um, here's a nice quote on the screen from my colleagues in Massachusetts uh, about what we're talking about when we talk about the partnership wild and scenic rivers. Um, a really different kind of model to exist in a place where the land ownership really is a patchwork of different kinds of managed lands. Next slide. So Alan told you a little bit about the um, history of Wild and Scenic and how it came about. Here's another way to think about it in perspective. We're very proud of um, the rivers that have been designated as Wild and Scenic, but you can see that they're a very small proportion of the national system of rivers that we have. Um, and that's part of why we continue to talk to you about potential new de designations and also a reason to really appreciate what you have in this region in the wild and scenic rivers that are designated on the Delaware River. Next slide. <clears throat> um, and can you, Sandra, can you just hit uh, the 
forward button, it should pull up a little, um, there you go. Okay, so Alan mentioned, um, you know, in this region, we're so fortunate, the upper and middle Delawares are designated as wild and scenic, but those are really managed as units in the National Park System, which means that they're administered much as you would think about a national park. Um, certainly, we take pride in the Northeast in doing management at the National Park Service in a collaborative way. But the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic River was really designated as an actual partnership wild and scenic river. And that is a model that developed about 20 years ago, um, largely in this middle uh, Atlantic region as a way, like I said, to be able to work with a river designation in a region where the land um, is a patchwork of ownership, ownership models. Um, and the benefit here is that all of you and all of the partners of the Wild and Scenic get to benefit from National Park Service um, services, from having a seat at the table on um, other agency committees, um, various resources that flow through the cooperative agreement, but the river is not managed as a unit of the Park Service. So that's a really special um, arrangement. Next slide. Here's another way of describing it from my colleague on the Woodpockatuck in Rhode Island, a river that just got designated um, at the very beginning of 2019. Gives you a feel in her words. Thanks, Sandra. So um, what does it mean that I'm here and that the National Park Service is sort of the, the backbone agency for the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic? Um, for one thing, I steward the cooperative agreement through which the funds come through um, the federal agency, federal government to the region. Uh, but also there are a couple of roles that I play in supporting the administration of the Wild and Scenic designation. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about section seven in a moment, um, but really it's about providing assistance to all of the committees and the partners associated with the uh, management council. And so I'm here in a support role um, and also to be a resource. Next slide. Yeah, you can just click it through there and those will pop up. Thank you. So, oh, you go back one, there you go. Um, so I, Alan mentioned some of the provisions associated with the act and we won't go into too many details here unless you do have questions. Um, but some of you, depending on how knowledgeable you are about wild and scenic, may know that um, the National Park Service has this obligation to make sure that um, the river is protected in its free flowing condition and that we protect these outstanding remarkable values, they're called, and they're outlined in the management plan for each region. The section seven piece um, that you see in that bottom block on the left that's where we really have some teeth as an agency to be part of a regulatory process when it comes to development projects in the region. Um, so where there is um, work of some sort in the river channel that involves any other federal agency, we have a review role. And um, again, Alan mentioned that's in response really to why the act was born in the first place in response to damming of rivers across the country. Um, there are a number of projects in the region that I'm sure many of you are involved in um, that you know, often I get questions, is this a place where the National Park Service will have a section seven review role? Um, section 11B there is what we talked about with regard to the cooperative agreements allowing the flow of some funding to these rivers. Next slide. So I mentioned these outstanding, outstandingly remarkable values. Those are named in the management plan. I bet many of you can highlight the various outstanding resources in this region even better than I can. Um, and part of the mandate for the Park Service in working with the council is to watch that those are protected. Next slide. So this piece about section seven, I, I often find there's some uh, need to demystify it. Um, as I said, it is a regulatory role. It can be confusing. Um, I, as the National Park Service staff person for the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic and for White Clay Creek, am ultimately responsible for that. But it's really something that we review with input from the Local Management Council. Next slide. 
So some of you may, I think we have some representatives actually from the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic Council on this call. Um, what am I talking about when I talk about a management committee or council? Well, that's a huge element of this partnership wild and scenic um, model. It's the collaborative body that brings together the partners in the region, both municipal partners, state and federal agency partners, as well as nonprofit leaders. And you know, it's so fascinating. We heard a lot this morning, if you were um, present for the lightning talks, incredible session, talking about what collaboration looks like um, in that vein. For us, collaboration with the National Park Service and these partnership rivers is really through that management council. In the case of Lower Delaware, we have a steering committee, which um, does a fantastic job. We're really looking to increase involvement in that management council from the, um, specifically from the municipalities along the wild and scenic designation. Welcome input and connection with all of you on the call who might be in the region about how to grow some of that um, collaboration potential. Next slide. The management committee is the group responsible for really shepherding the um, management plan forward. So all of the goals that are specified in that management plan and working with the budget that comes through the federal assistance. Um, and you're gonna hear a little bit in a little bit from my colleague Mark um, specifically about the work of the Lower Delaware group and we, we wanna get to that. Next slide. So this idea of potential other designations in the region, we'd love to chat with any of you more about that going forward. Um, some of the first questions to ask are, would the Partnership Wild and Scenic River model be a good fit for the river I wish was designated? And here are some questions to ask. Um, we do have a toolkit, you'll see a link for that at the end of the presentation that lives online um, that we've tried to really build information in there to help you think through um, what it takes to get a designation to happen in any particular region. Next slide. And it all begins with a study. The study itself um, comes with federal funds to um, support the process. And in that study process is the development of a management plan and the building of this collaboration at ground level. Um, and like I said, there's a number of additional resources we have on that. And when we get to the questions and answers section, if we'd like to dig more into the study um, and designation process, we can do that. I believe we've had previous forum presentations specifically on that topic. And many of the people in this session are, are real resources on it. Next slide. So I'm, you're gonna stop hearing from me at this point and um, we'd like to bring up any questions or discussions you'd like to have. And I, um, Sandra's gonna help us with uh, any that appear in the chat area. That's a great way to do that. I have a few questions I thought I'd put out to all of you who came on the call since we have a small group and we can really get at some of these. Um, being the new National Park Service liaison in this region, I'm curious what issues or hot topics come to mind for you in working with the Wild and Scenic um, Management Council and or the National Park Service? How can we increase engagement on the council, particularly at the municipal levels? And this last bullet, the National Park Service is really wrestling with how do we um, increase, improve our lens around social vulnerability, issues of um, systematic inequalities, um, we've heard a little bit about um, during the kickoff this morning already so far, and that is definitely on our minds, how to weave that into the partnership model. So I, I'm going to stop talking there and allow um, Sandra for you to facilitate us through any questions here or um, questions for me or Alan or specific points you'd like to raise in light of what we discussed. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Alan. So folks, feel free to use the chat box or, you know, given that we are in a small, relatively small group, we have about, you know, we have 29 folks here. Feel free to take yourself off mute too, uh, and you can ask a question that way. I don't have any questions in the chat box just yet, Sarah. Okay, we can give it one more minute and then certainly go into the presentation. Folks are noodling 
on their <laughs> thoughts until the end, I guess. That's great. So um, I'm very happy to pass the microphone to my colleague, Mark, from the Appalachian Mountain Club. He is also on the board of DRGP. Um, Mark has an incredible amount of knowledge and expertise in this region and was has been someone who has been forwarding the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic Council forward through the years. So uh, without further ado, he is going to tell us a little more specifically about the work in this region. Thank you so much, Sarah. I did just have a technology glitch, so please, if I freeze or lose audio, if you could mention it in the chat, or if one of the co-presenters could send me a text message, should that happen, I'd appreciate it. We're gonna take a look at what the Wild and Scenic Program does on the ground and what the Lower Delaware designation um, has looked like, what the history was leading up to it, what the current issues are, uh, and how that partnership in the Lower Delaware region is effectively moving forward their management plan and engaging stakeholders. Um, so I'm excited to drill down a little bit from my experience with the Lower Delaware. Many of you in the program today have known the Lower Delaware for decades, even before its wild and scenic designation. So please feel free to add your comments or thoughts in the chat and we'll have a time for you to unmute yourself and, and speak up and we'd love to hear from you. Um, I wanted to start by introducing uh, Dump the Pump, and, and while the Upper and Middle Delaware designations uh, were moving forward in the 1970s, the, the Lower Delaware uh, did not have the political support to be included in the Wild and Scenic Program, largely because of this particular issue, Dump the Pump, which was uh, a proposal to take water out of the Lower Delaware region and pump it uh, across the mountain. Um, so we'll take a quick look at what that campaign looked like. And some of these development threats, such as Dump the Pump, um, are great milestones. One, they were big mobilizing forces for the region to get together and advocates to connect with one another. Uh, and, um, and we'll get through that here quickly in a minute. Uh, this is the specific around um, the specific proposal uh, that mobilized advocates across the lower Delaware region. So it would have taken water from the Delaware, pumped it uh, across the mountain into Montgomery County uh, for the Limerick Generating Station and for other water supply purposes. And it wasn't just uh, another kind of inner basin transfer proposal. It really got garnered national and regional attention. Um, you can see that these kinds of news clippings um, certainly show that advocates are passionate and vocal uh, and brought forward um, quite a bit of resistance and opposition to this proposal. And uh, I'm glad they did. Um, famed activist Abby Hoffman participated uh, in the Dump the Pump demonstrations as well as a variety of other protesters. And this wasn't a one-time event. This was a multi-year campaign uh, involving just a, a host of different advocates, communities, uh, and interest groups. Um, I know some of you were around and participate in the Dump the Pump movement. If you have a favorite memory or if one of these photos resonates with you, feel free to throw it up in the chat, make a little comment about uh, what Dump the Pump means to you. Um, unfortunately, the pump was constructed in the 1980s, even after protests of, of folks who were trying to stop construction by kind of chaining themselves to the construction equipment itself. Um, so that, that unfortunate reality led that advocacy group to then turn to Congress and say, we have to protect the Lower Delaware region in the Wild and Scenic Program. And they were successful in initiating a study in 1992. Uh, the study is the first step in this process. So Congress will tell the National Park Service to take a look at the Lower Delaware or any river section and ask the hard questions. Um, do the resource values justify designation under this uh, remarkably unique program to help protect free, free flowing rivers and other outstandingly remarkable resource values? Um, and, and amazingly, while the study was underway, the advocates in the communities along the geography started drafting the management plan, knowing that they would ultimately be successful in getting this region designated, and then they could hit the ground running to implement that management plan. Um, so that management plan was finalized in 1997. The Lower Delaware study was, was still underway. And this is the region of the Lower Delaware when we talk about it. Uh, it's from the, the, the southern portion of Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area, where Route 80 crosses the Delaware River, roughly, all the way down to Trenton Falls, um, to the beginning of the tidal section of the Delaware River. And in fact, the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic Corridor Study included uh, the tributaries in Pennsylvania. Uh, and those tributaries ultimately um, had great resource values, and they were included in the designation. Those are the tributaries um, in Bucks County here. Uh, so kind of looking at that management plan, it included these areas of focus. 
uh, you can tell that these are reflected um, in the management plan currently. And these are the identified features that had those outstandingly remarkable resource values. High quality water, high quality recreation, uh, open space, and um, communities along the corridor as well and their integration to these assets. Uh, this photo is the Lambert Bill Wing Dam, if you're not familiar with it. And this is the largest structure that's in the Delaware River in the lower Delaware. Uh, and it is not a, a dam per se, but it does include features that restrict the, the flow down to a, a central point. Um, so moving on, the, um, the Heritage Conservancy helped to kick off this effort for wild and scenic designation and supported uh, the advocates that were dealing with Dump the Pump and, and helping to mobilize those efforts into the wild and scenic designation. Uh, the Heritage Conservancy helped to spin off a new nonprofit organization, the Delaware River Greenway Partnership. Uh, and somewhat similar to White Clay Creek and the other partnership rivers, uh, the, the Delaware River Greenway Partnership was a bi-state nonprofit that was designed uh, to support the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic Program specifically. And uh, ultimately, the Wild and Scenic designation was uh, included in an act that passed Congress and was signed by the president. And as I mentioned, it included the Lower Delaware main stem and uh, the tributaries on the, the Pennsylvania side of the river. And here's a you know, screenshot of that act. Uh, quickly, the advocates and communities got together to form a management committee. Uh, they worked on their incorporating documents for a number of years. And in 2004, they were fully uh, up and running uh, with all of those documents and began to implement the river management plan. Now, if you remember what Sarah was mentioning and Alan about federally appropriated money, uh, this is really the point where that manage management committee was playing a leadership role in implementing the management plan and also spending some of those federal dollars to help achieve the kinds of outcomes they were seeking. Um, some of those funds were put to really good use in my opinion, and we'll talk about the use of federal funds over the next couple of slides here. Um, two of the main projects that you'll see featured on this slide is the Delaware River Water Trail and the Delaware River Scenic Byway. Uh, both of those projects were kicked off with National Park Service funding and the Delaware River Greenway Partnership um, helped to create the de designation for the Delaware River Water Trail. It's um, you know, it's a multi-state effort and that water trail is helping to coordinate landowners and river managers across the region and also host things like the interactive map on the website and the print guide. Um, the Delaware River Scenic Byway is a, a, a designation um, for the New Jersey portion of the Lower Delaware uh, that helps to connect um, communities to each other and businesses to the, to the surrounding geography. Uh, it's been a great way to promote the Lower Delaware for tourism, um, especially tourism that's not as on river oriented as, as I would be floating down the river in a canoe. A lot of people experience the Lower Delaware by car or through the cultural experiences that they have at these communities, uh, through art and, and other types of, uh, of things that are, are quite um, unique about the Lower Delaware geography. Um, thank you very much. In 2015, a 15-year accomplishment report was published looking at what the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic Program was able to achieve over that timeline. Uh, and can you imagine that over a million dollars in federal funding uh, was applied from the National Park Service through the cooperative agreements to help implement the management plan um, and get a lot of projects on the ground. Um, so the Wild and Scenic designation is, is not just um, a program to bring Sarah into the loop and help work with your community. It's an opportunity to get these funds on the ground in a targeted way uh, and in the way that the management committee and the local partners um, prioritize on their own. This is what that 15 year accomplishment report looked like. I encourage you to take a look online. It uh, gives a 15 year timeline of what projects were completed and what it looked like. I really like this because it gives um, perspective on how the management plan works. Sometimes there is a misunderstanding that the wild and scenic designation is, um, for example, preventing development from moving forward along the river, or it's only focused on water quality, or it's only focused on preventing dams from being built. And um, it's not only focused on anything, it's focused on all of the bullet points included in the management plan. And this document speaks a lot to um, historic resource studies that were funded and just a lot of different types of projects that really make sense within the framework that the Lower Delaware Management Committee has put together. 
So moving forward in 2016, the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic Management Committee was reorganized, new operating structure put in place, uh, and that was uh, formalized and adopted. Um, it became the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic Management Council, and it continues to be, as Sarah mentioned, a very effective voice um, for advancing the river management plan and for bringing together communities, advocates, uh, and other groups. Um, the guest speakers have been a huge value add, I think, to the region, and folks have come out to enjoy um, some great learning experiences with the management um, council. And then as mentioned here is the mini grant program, uh, which is one way that the management committee helps to get funds on the ground. So it's been 20 years, right, since the Lower Delaware was designated, um, and nothing stays the same, but the goal of the Wild and Scenic Program is to make sure that the outstandingly remarkable resource values that were identified in the study that was used as the basis for designating the region as a Wild and Scenic River, we're working to make sure that those outstandingly remarkable resource values uh, are upheld and maintained and not uh, lost over time. Um, so one of the issues we've been facing today is, uh, is a, a heavy recreational use, and certainly this year has been uh, a noteworthy example of, of heavy interest in outdoor recreation and the challenges that it poses uh, when outdoor recreation exceeds the available capacity of parking areas and, and other types of resource uh, limitations. Um, and unfortunately, challenges this year have led to the closure of some access points. Uh, the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic Management committee or council is working very hard on this and they've uh, kicked off a, a, a $20,000 study to look at um, river capacity or look at the use of the river corridor for recreation and how that use may be consistent or inconsistent with the other goals of the management plan. So what would it mean for water quality uh, if we saw extreme heavy recreational use during the middle of the season? Um, are there impacts, et cetera? So that study is, is going to be kicking off and moving forward. <clears throat> Um, this fall, in fact, and, and very excited about it. Uh, so I think the Lower Delaware program has been successful. It's been um, exciting, but it's a partnership. And I think all of you are involved in partnerships, whether it's the Coalition for the Delaware for Watershed uh, or a local partnership to create a new hiking trail or signage project. And um, the thing with partnerships is that they require commitment, buy-in, and they require people to come together. And, and having Sarah and the Park Service be the backbone of that process uh, provides great stability, but it is, a, is it is an ongoing effort to recruit, support, and engage partners. Um, and I just mentioned that partnership rivers are wonderful, but all of you who work with partnerships also know that partnerships require support. Um, so whether it's the Park Service, the Delaware Greenway Partnership, or the multitude of other nonprofit organizations across the geography uh, that help provide some additional backbone to the program. Um, I'm so thankful that we've been so successful over the last 20 years. Uh, and, um, and, and that's, you know, another plea to, to think about how you can better support uh, the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic Program uh, if you live in this geography or if you uh, represent one of these municipalities, for example. So that's a, a quick perspective on how we got to where we are today. And really excited to turn it over to Patty Ruby from Hunter and Land Trust to, to focus on what uh, the Wild and Scenic Program has allowed their organization to do and to also get a better understanding of volunteering and supporting the Management Council. What does the partnership really look and feel like? Um, so that's where we're going to be turning next. And uh, Patty, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, well, I am going to drill down a little bit more about the Council and how we operate. So who are we? You know, you've been hearing about all these partners and how they've come together to get all this work done. So primarily, we are government agencies and nonprofits that have come together. Sarah started to touch on this earlier. We have a number of counties, municipalities, state agencies, and even commissions like the Delaware River Basin Commission as part of our partnership. In the past, there have been a few individuals, primarily politicians, that have also joined the effort. But I do want to stress that this is voluntary. So all the entities that have come together have chosen to do so. And when they make that choice, they sign a memorandum of understanding that basically says they'll support the management plan and participation in this council. So the municipalities, um, actually, Sandra, can we go back a slide because we're actually one ahead of where we need to be? Thank you, that's it. So this map shows which of the municipalities in the lower Delaware region are designated. And that means that they have chosen to sign the MOU and become an active member of this partnership. 
uh, the green municipalities are those that are designated at the moment. The ones that we're looking for are the red and the purple. So they're eligible to participate, but they have not yet gone forward to make the decision to sign the MOU and become an active partner. So if you look at this map, I think it's interesting that a number of these towns are in counties that have agreed to participate. So Bucks County, Warren County, and Hunterdon County are all signed on as partners, but there are towns within those counties. So Regalsville and Durham, for instance, in Bucks, Holland Township in Hunterdon, and then Pohatcon, White Township, and Belvedere in Warren County. We're still looking for partnerships with those towns. So um, again, there's, there's more towns than that, but I'm just talking about the counties that are involved. So if you look at this map and you're familiar with these towns, maybe you have connections there, maybe you live there, there's ways that you could help us make some inroads and really get some partners where we're looking to have more participation in this effort. So if everyone can look at that, we'd really appreciate that and you can reach out to us. We have contacts at the end of the presentation for you to reach out to us. So once a town is designated, they identify a representative to send to the council meetings and then they can participate actively in all of the work that we're doing. So now that you know who we are, we have the council, which we've described previously, so they meet quarterly. So they have an agenda that is a little lighter, but they elect the steering committee. So as I said earlier, I'm a member of the steering committee. We meet monthly and we deal with the more day-to-day -day issues that come up. And I'll get into that in, in future slides here. But anyone who's in these towns or with non-government agencies that are working in this area, could join us and help move forward the goals of the river management plan. Sandra, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So what do we do? So as I said, the steering committee meets monthly to deal with a lot of issues and the council's meeting quarterly. So we're working together to implement the river management plan, which others have presented to you earlier. And mostly we're working on local issues, but we're also providing education and outreach. So as Mark just touched on, you know, we've had some really interesting learning opportunities so there's a number of ways that we do that. So we're reaching out through eBlast, so you can sign up for that. The website is at the bottom of the slide, so if you go there, you can join our list and be on our emails, and that's gonna notify you about upcoming meetings, but also events that partners are putting on or educational opportunities. We also advertise events that are things like cleanups, anything to get people engaged in helping us move the river management plan forward. Um, at the same time, we're actually hosting lectures and presentations at the council meetings. So at our quarterly meetings, people can attend just to learn about issues that they're interested in. So for instance, in the past, we've talked about fisheries, water quality issues, even history on the river, like flooding incidents, invasive species. You could imagine anything that's relevant for the river or even hot topics at the time. You know, we will have speakers and discuss it and even move action forward that might come out of those discussions. So it's another opportunity for us to educate the public about what's happening. So we also have tried to increase capacity and share our expertise through this partnership. So for instance, with capacity issues, we do provide mini grants. So for municipalities in this area, for instance, or non-government agencies, they might apply for grants to do some local projects. We also comment on local projects, so then we might review development proposals or whatever it might be to add some expertise and capacity to those local towns. We also facilitate local projects with municipalities. Um, actually, you can go back a slide. <laughs> We're not quite here yet, sorry. Um, we facilitate some of these projects, and I will go into further examples in a moment, but we're facilitating work for these municipalities. And then I also wanted to give an example of how we share expertise. So you can imagine that all of the partners that come together at these meetings have very different backgrounds and have access to different resources. So when there's an issue that we're discussing, they can bring different perspectives to the table and help solve these issues. So one of the examples that I thought of recently was the Delaware River Greenway Partnership was hiring a, a contractor basically to do studies around arsenic testing as a result of the pennies pipeline that is potentially, hopefully not, um, coming through this region. We wanted to get a baseline understanding what's happening with arsenic. So when they wanted to hire the contractor, I was involved in the process to help oversee how that was developed and just oversee the contractor's work because I have a background in water quality data collection. So I was able to help that organization just because of my background. 
So that's an example of how we come together to help each other get things done that benefit the river. Now you can go to the next slide. So this is again diving into the examples a little further. So one of the ways that we facilitate projects with the towns is through land preservation. And I'm using that example because as Hunterdon Land Trust, we're a land conservancy and land protection is one of the major ways that we contribute to implementing the river management plan. So in our area, you can imagine that our municipalities are fairly small. They don't have a lot of staff and many don't have any kind of open space director or someone that's designated as the person that preserves land for the town. So we actually fill that gap essentially for the town. You know, we step in and facilitate these projects. So that means that we identify parcels that are critical to preserving water quality and quantity. So Hunter and Land Trust has developed a strategic plan looking at water in the watershed and trying to figure out which land would be best to protect to preserve that water quality and quantity. So that means that we're often preserving land with category one streams in New Jersey. That's a surface water quality standard. That means that that water is very good and we don't wanna allow anything to happen to create measurable change. We don't want it degraded in any way. So that's our best water to protect um, in this region, in the corridor. So we'll work with the towns to identify good project sites. And then of course we negotiate with the landowners so that we can come up with a, an agreement to purchase that land or preserve it with an easement. And then we order all the technicals. So what we might have an appraisal done, a survey, an environmental assessment, you know, whatever needs to be done to get the project to closing. And that includes applying for money because we all know you have to bring money to the table to buy land or to buy an easement. So we will apply for that funding and shepherd it to the closing table. And then we also have an attorney on staff that actually helps with the closing. So we get that deal done and the land is preserved at the end of the day. So these pictures just give you a sense of some of the really special places right along the river that have been protected um, through these kinds of partnership efforts. So in just the past five years, because that's the period we just were looking at for, for our report, <laughs> we've actually preserved more than a thousand acres in the Wild and Scenic Corridor. And that's a lot of work for a staff that really has one main person doing land preservation, you know. So, we're turning out a lot of good work, but that work also leverages millions of dollars from state and county and private foundations, even federal funding, um, not from NPS. <laughs> and it brings that money into our region. So you can imagine by us applying for those funds, we're bringing more resources to the wild and scenic effort and to implementing our river management plan. So uh, we can go to the next slide. Another example of how we add capacity is through advocacy. So as I mentioned earlier, we might be working with towns on issues that they're opposing, or I hope in the future we will be able to be more proactive. And Sarah started touching on this, you know, that we want to get more municipalities involved. We want to be able to work with them before these projects are proposed, because once it's out there and they're being reviewed, there aren't a lot of ways to stop them if they're consistent with all the regulations. If we look at it more proactively, we could try to plan better so that we're not going to ever see these projects. You know, they're never eligible to be approved in the areas that we're trying to protect. But for now, we're looking at a lot of major things, including the Penny's Pipeline, as I mentioned, which I imagine most of you are familiar with. It has been a big threat in this area for six or seven years now. But hey, we're fighting the good fight. You know, it's been six or seven years and this project is still not on the ground. It's missing a lot of approvals. So we're really hoping that we can still stop this. But from Hunter and Land Trust's perspective, we have land that we own along the route that they propose. So we were dragged into litigation early, we're an intervener, you know, we're fighting this as best we can, but we're only one organization. So it's been great to work with partners, including Wild and Scenic, who are also fighting the same project. You know, we can share resources and keep each other up to date on what's happening and what we might need to respond to. So that's always great, you know, and that's, that's a really obvious example of the kinds of things that we're trying to stop. There's also a lot of warehouse developments. I imagine a lot of you are seeing it in your own communities with so much buying online, <laughs> they need these spaces. But if the towns haven't planned proactively, they end up in terrible locations for water quality protection or even access to the river. So we are trying to comment on those and help the towns mitigate those negative impacts as best we can. There's also been some proposals to downgrade tributaries like the Tohican in Pennsylvania. So we try to comment on that and stop those things from happening. And of course, there's projects to expand or redevelop historic bridges to meet current transportation needs, but we don't want to lose the historic aspect of those resources. So again, we get involved and try to 
mitigate any negative impacts. So those are just some examples of the ways that we get involved to add capacity to local towns and we share expertise with each other to try to come up with the best solutions and network with the broadest possible, you know, set of resources, let's say, to try to get these things done and support the river management plan. So I hope that gives you a, a better understanding of how the partners all work together and the value that it adds to both the council and to the individual organizations that are participating. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Alan to wrap it up with a few more words on the Musconnect Kong River. Great, thanks Patty. So the Musconnect Kong Wild Scenic River is set up very similar to the Lower Delaware. We have a river management council and you can see here a photo uh, from a council meeting in the fall. Uh, it's volunteers who are uh, appointed municipal or county representatives for the most part. Uh, we do have some professional staff from like county planning agencies and we've also invited like the State Park Service to attend and the Lake Capacon Commission and uh, the Wildlife Management Area Manager. Um, so we're New Jersey's largest tributary to Delaware. As you can see here in our map, we have some that um, aren't designated down by Holland and Pohacon Township as well, but we're awaiting the Secretary of Interior approval now that we've gotten the municipal support to do that. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? So I just wanted to share some other examples about how uh, we address issues on our, our river. Uh, similar to Lower Delaware, uh, we have natural resources, cultural, historic resources that are important for our wild and scenic designation. Uh, we use our funding to help people get out on the river. We do schedule trips uh, when we're able to do that. We have an in-school education program. Uh, we have just recently done a signage program. Uh, we believe that once people know that there is a resource that they can identify with it, then they know it's something special and uh, to, can protect it. So we work with uh, Trout Unlimited to get and uh, National Park Service for funding for wild and scenic signs and then our local municipalities to get those signs put up with the support of their road departments. One of the interesting things about our river is that we have uh, a very long history of human inhabitation. One of our outstandingly remarkable values was an archeological site going back to 13,000 uh, BC uh, where people were living along the river, probably enjoying the fish out of the river uh, in about you know, 10 miles, 15 miles south of the Wisconsin ice sheet. Uh, there's a large settlement there and human habitation continues today. And uh, if it wasn't for the support of the National Park Service, we probably would not have been able to do outreach with uh, the Native American community with the Lenape. Uh, we put up some interpretive signs indicating where there were villages along the river. And we worked with the local municipal officials uh, in selecting those sites and promoting them. So you can see a photo here of that. And also like the Lower Delaware, we've seen increased recreational usage this year. So one of the things we always said about our River Management Council, well, if there was ever an issue with recreational access, well, the council would be the place where it would come up. But we never really had that much of an issue. Our river, it's about 46 miles long, about half of that's designated wild and scenic. We have over 50 access sites. So you have the opportunity to really spread out and where we don't have the flows that Delaware does. We're mostly seeing uh, fishing access, tubing, and some seasonal when the water flows are up, boating. Well, this year was different. And we saw a lot of our very primitive sites, you know, without restrooms, uh, without picnicking facilities, uh, being, and without swimming facilities, you know, being used for swimming and picnicking and campfires. And we started hearing that from our communities and from residents. So our last River Management Council meeting, we said, okay, well, let's get all the river manage, uh, all the public land managers together and ask them, well, what are you seeing? Uh, what support do you need? Do we need a coordinated message? So we got the state park superintendent that covered all the northern region of the state. We got the wildlife management area representative who covered all the northern region of the state, the municipal park um, representatives, and uh, the county park representatives. And we did a round robin. We asked them, what are you seeing? What strategies are you using? Um, are there ways we can support you? So one example you see here and the photograph was one town, uh, one, sorry, a county put a mobile uh, construction sign up indicating what the park rules were, that there actually wasn't swimming allowed there because there's not facilities for it and not uh, picnicking there. It's more of a primitive setup. Um, some of the ones that had law enforcement talked about 
uh, how the law enforcement staff would respond to uh, reportings of, of trash or inappropriate use or fires being left un unattended. And the municipal representatives talked about, you know, the work that their departments of public work were doing trying to just keep up with trash. But in general, what we were seeing was hot spots. So there was this perception in social media about uh, certain places that were then characterizing the entire river. And in our case, we don't have as much information about where you can go. We don't have a water trail. We don't have a map. And so we're seeing people going where it's obvious along the road. So in the future, we might try to think about um, more uh, information about recreation and appropriate recreational use and making sure that everyone can enjoy these public resources. Um, so that was something that we wanted to share uh, with this group. It's just like a very practical way about how a river management council can take an emerging issue and then look at it and then try to develop responses to it. Next slide. So Sarah mentioned that there is information about how to become a partnership while in Scenic River. And the River Management Society, together with many other partners, put together this toolkit about partnership with Scenic Rivers. So this website link will take you right there. This um, presentation will be available to you, uh, and you can look at it later on. Uh, but it goes through those steps about, is my river the right river? What's the study process, the study process and what's the designation process? Next. So where would you get more information? So that slide was about how you become a partnership river. If you want to take a look and see where there's other wild and scenic rivers across the country and just learn more about that uh, program, go to rivers.gov. It's a really good website, has interactive GIS maps showing where these rivers are. Earlier, we also shared a link to the National Rivers Inventory, so you can go back in the slideshow to find that, to see if you have one of these segments is already identified as eligible, which you can also get there from rivers.gov. If you want to find out more and uh, to talk with someone about it, reach out to Sarah. She's a National Park Service representative for uh, the Lower Delaware, and uh, she's more than happy to field some of those uh, questions and you know, help you figure out if you're interested in the study process, how to get started in that. Uh, Mark and Patty are both engaged with the Lower Delaware uh, Wild and Scenic River Council. So if you want to learn more about that council or how you can form partnerships, you can reach out to them. If you want to learn more about the Musconet County, you can reach out to me. And one of the things I want to mention that's what it's so important with these partnerships is that, you know, we had the first panel this morning talking about the Delaware Watershed Conservation Fund. And there's a variety of management plans considered in that uh, funding opportunity, but then also you heard about the Delaware Watershed Collaborative. Those wild scenic river management plans can be part of a priority for an application going to the Delaware Watershed Conservation Fund. They're an allowable priority. And also those plans will be considered in how that overall collaborative approaches uh, a river restoration plan too. So we're really looking to partnerships overall, as you can tell it's our ethos, and trying to support that across the, the Delaware you know, river basin and, and not have any duplication and make sure that, you know, we're really working synergistically with everyone else. And I think we have one more slide here. We wanted to do a poll again. So we want to check in with everyone and see uh, if people learn more about wild scenic rivers, uh, which your river's closest now, and uh, if there's any in new interest in uh, becoming a designated wild and scenic river. So if you could take a, you know, 20 seconds or so to fill this out. And uh, we're happy to start taking questions now too. So if you want to um, start sending some in the chat box. And um, I think after we do the poll results, we'll, you know, would be a good time if people are just going to uh, go off mute and ask us questions. We have about 22% of folks who have voted. It's slowly ticking up. We'll give folks another couple seconds. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I'll share the results now from the poll. All right. Well, it does look like folks have learned a little bit more about the Wild Scenic River program. That's great. We're glad you're paying attention and enjoying uh, the presentation. Uh, see folks are, you know, mostly uh, close to the lower Delaware, which makes sense. The geography probably did not change too much during the presentation. And uh, we're glad to see that uh, folks are interested in helping designate uh, new rivers, but then also some folks realize maybe it's not quite right for their river. Um, so thank you for participating in that poll. And uh, we're happy to take questions now. So if you want, you can unmute yourself and ask or um, send us a, a question via the chat box. So I have one question that came in through the chat box from Marianne Carroll. She says, um, can you talk about the challenges of dealing with municipalities who are concerned about limitations of designation um, that may impose on future development and how to overcome such concerns? Well, I can start to answer that. <laughs> Ellen, did you want to take it? No, Patty, how about you go ahead? I'll fill in. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, part of the problem we've seen is that there is a misconception that choosing to participate will somehow force some sort of limitations or regulations on a municipality when that's not the case. So there's actually no regulatory change that occurs when a town actually signs the MOU. So even though we're, they're asking their town, you know, to in spirit, support the river management plan and participate in the council, they're not being forced to do anything specific. And earlier we had talked about a more proactive approach, trying to work with these towns to look at their current plans. You know, if they look at their master plan and they decide we don't want warehouses right along the river, then they can make those changes themselves and we can help them with those changes and, and, and we can help them identify those problems. But we're not forcing them to choose any particular outcome in those plans. So I think that's one key piece to take away for everybody that again, it's always voluntary for these participants to join the council and to do what they feel they can to move the plan forward. And I'd say with uh, the Musconetcon River, you know, very, very similar. And, you know, the approach that we see the National Park Service often taking is one about identifying alternatives that might have uh, lesser impacts towards uh, the river and uh, whichever value might be impacted. So an example that our river manager often gives, our National Park Service river manager, is about cell phone towers. So you might have a cell phone tower being proposed that's visible in a scenic designated segment. And that doesn't mean that the tower, you know, is prohibited necessarily. It means that you might look at an alternative siting. Could it be put somewhere else for a similar impact that's perhaps less visible? Could it have the stealth technology of um, tree branches added to it if it's going to be above the tree line? Or could it be, uh, could the height of it be changed? Uh, we've seen the same with uh, water towers. Um, you know, if something's being built along the river, sometimes visual screening, like a tree buffer, is being proposed to accommodate um, the visual impacts on the river. So there's a variety of ways that uh, a project could be approached. Ones that have permanent outcomes, say, to water quality, I think perhaps are the ones that are most concerning that might impact the free-flowing conditions or, say, uh, significant wildlife identified in the river management plan. We have uh, a potentially um, to be listed uh, mussel in our river. Um, so something that could affect that might be an issue. Uh, something that could affect uh, temperature discharge in the river that could make the trout habitat uh, less desirable, less able to support trout. That could be something that the Park Service might review. But most of it is up to the partners and whether the town after the MOU or after the resolution then decides to change their zoning or their master plan and is informed by that river management plan um, and that's something that we're trying to do is uh, use some of that National Park Service funding to do a zoning analysis and communicate back to our towns the uh, ordinances that could be best protective of the water quality along the wild scenic segments. Great, 
Great, thanks. Um, I have another question in a chat box from Eric Clark. Eric writes, how likely is a designation for the section of the Delaware River, Trenton and South? Uh, Eric, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with a response. Um, and it will probably, <clears throat> excuse me, require some follow-up, but in my review of the Lower Delaware Wall and Scenic Study, they did begin to look at the tidal section south of Trenton. And uh, I don't believe that they identified outstandingly remarkable resource values that would justify a designation for the tidal Delaware under the Wild and Scenic Program. And it may also be tied to a question that I will kick to Sarah, that the Wild and Scenic Program is designed to protect free-flowing rivers. Once you get south of Trenton, you're now in a tidal zone. I don't think the act is actually applicable in a tidal river, though it would be applicable in the tributaries to it. But Sarah, could you clarify on if, if there's eligibility for rivers that have tidal influence? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, you know, some of our rivers, um, Great Egg comes to mind, are, are I, I'm not sure if they're, I would think that they're characterized as tidal, so tidal. tidal. So there is some precedent for that. Um, I don't know that the act specifies specifically um, any reason why, you know, again, as long as there was uh, free flowing and water quality characteristics and outstandingly remarkable values, why we couldn't pursue that for those reasons. Um, Alan, do you have any more additional perspective from your work with Paul with regard to um, tidal rivers? Yeah, so I, I don't think tidal affects it being free flowing. Uh, there's a number of rivers, the Great Egg and the Morris River that are both designated and have tidal influence. Uh, the York has also been studied for that up in Maine and has a tidal influence. But the Delaware itself could have additional sections that are eligible. So there's one four mile section south of Philadelphia between New Jersey and Delaware that's listed on the National River Inventory as eligible. So that's definitely tidal and it's part of the bay, but it's still, it's still the river part of the river. Uh, you know, I think some people have discussed, could you have an urban wild and scenic river? Well, it would depend upon how you're looking at those outstandingly remarkable values. And recreation is one of those values. But there has to be some consideration around this idea of, you know, what do you consider its significance and, and does the development along the shoreline affect that? Um, so it could be a real interesting proposition to try to reach out and conduct a study or to see if there's a feasibility of doing a study on more of those urban rivers. And I think historically, you know, the water quality perhaps in many urban uh, rivers uh, may not have been that great back when this act was written, but the water quality has improved quite a lot. And so the conditions on the ground might support a designation now that perhaps in the past, you know, would not have been supported, may not have even been um, something that people would have considered then. Uh, and it, it could be a great boon for uh, equity of access to a resource and e equity in the management of that resource as well. Great question. I have a follow-up question. Why wouldn't we consider a wild and scenic tidal Delaware designation for the tidal rivers as noted in the river inventory. We should. Right. right, Sarah? Yes, and for those of you who are less familiar with it, um, what this person is referring to is the NRI, the National Rivers Inventory, which has named, already named, rivers all over the country that have potential for designation. So, um, provides a platform to take the next step with many of those rivers uh, named in the inventory. Another question specifically for Sarah from J.R. Fisher with Delaware River Greenway Partnership. Uh, J.R. writes, Sarah, what do you see as the differences and opportunities between the two management styles directly through uh, National Park Service and partnership rivers? Great question. So interesting. So again, um, the upper and middle Delaware being managed as units of the National Park Service, whereas the lower Delaware is this partnership rivers model. Boy, there are a lot of different ways to attack that question. 
You know, for one thing, um, being a unit of the National Park Service comes with very specific resources, right? Seasonal staffing, um, a planning budget, um, and in some ways, you could argue an easier decision-making model, right? Decisions go through a very specific hierarchy at the park unit, at the river unit. Um, but what that means is in a lot of ways, they also can't be as nimble. I don't know if any of you have um, seen the quote, quote um, the book of regulations the national park units have to work within. There's incredible amount of processes for um, NPS units uh, you know, to make sure that they're following federal policy and doing good by, you know, the public lands. Um, what we have in the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic, in some ways, is much more complicated, right? Working through a collaborative model, as has already been noted by my colleagues, but also all morning, you know, it's an incredible amount of energy and thought that goes into administering a program collaboratively, trying to make decisions within a collaborative um, body. But what does that provide us, right? That provides us incredible input to make the best decisions possible for everybody at ground level. It provides engagement as sort of a, an end in itself, a, a positive thing for both community and river resources. It also provides a certain amount of nimbleness, right? So um, there's actually much more room for Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic to pursue certain projects and programs and maybe think creatively about what their goals should be um, than would be feasible in a park unit. You know, the wonderful thing about these two models working together is that we can benefit from each other's expertise. And for example, Mark spoke to um, user capacity and recreation issues as a major theme this summer um, and a theme of the council going forward. Just last Friday, there was an incredible call with the state of New Jersey and a whole range of local government officials and nonprofits to get at recreation use on the lower Delaware and places where there were issues this summer. And I was able to invite my colleagues, chief rangers from upper Delaware and middle Delaware to the call and able to learn from their, from their experience. So whereas they see a recreation issue on their park lands, they're able to make a decision, direct parking, put a ranger out, do things rather clear cut, not that it's not a complicated issue, but the decision making is simpler. In our case, um, it's a much more complicated model along the lower Delaware, and yet I'm able to call on um, the expertise right next door with the Park Service, bring them to the call, and we get to all work together towards that solution. So certainly pros and cons with each. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, given the matrix of um, land management along the lower Delaware, it was really the only model feasible here, um, but it provides that great platform um, for really empowering local decision making. I'd like to add one thing about this too, and that is when you look at the different management approaches, there is a different way that the resources are allocated. So with the national park, like the upper Delaware, which was a river segment that was designated, not a lot of federal land, but some, you know, you need to have enough staff to run, you know, a ranger presence, a law enforcement presence, most, most times and days of the year. You also usually have a natural resource section, you have an interpretation section. There's just a certain throughput of personnel and resources that people expect at a national park unit. That upper Delaware park receives about the same money as the partnership wild scenic rivers do for 17 rivers. So on the assumption that the partners are going to be bringing resources to the table so they have skin in the game for implementing those rivers too. Now that might make the partnership rivers a bit more nimble uh, and get more buy-in and get more collaboration and more um, support from the community, because you always have to go to the community for support. Can we do this river cleanup? Can we get volunteers out for water quality monitoring? Uh, who can help out and run the summer camp? Um, so, or who can help clear a trail or check out an access point to see what the issue is going on? So you get more engagement, but I, you know, one of the drawbacks is also consistency of being able to engage in uh, protecting that resource, whether it be around zoning and ordinances or outreach or, or whatnot. Um, that is one of the chief differences, but you know, like many institutions in our democracy, we are expecting people to stand up and participate, and that's no different with the partnership model. It's baked in. Anyone else have any other questions? That's all I'm seeing on the chat, bo chat box thus far, but if folks have questions, feel free to take yourself uh, off mute. 
I do want to add one other thing that I forgot to mention about differences in federal and partnership models. There was um, one of the issues with the federal model is the taking of land. And that was one of the issues that the partnership model sought to avoid by establishing a, a here's a national resource, but we're going to imagine private land. So that earlier slide I had about uh, the Tox Island Dam project and the creation of the Delaware Water Gap. And in our region, that whole process had a lot of resentment uh, that still lingers in our community. Uh, and something similar happened with the Upper Delaware. And that's why uh, their management has a council but still this federal role. So the council advises the federal government in its management. If you're in a place with strong home rule and uh, private property rights, the partnership model might be the only wild scenic model that fits in there. And it's something that I know some uh, folks, advocates in the Western states have been looking at more to try and fill in gaps between large federal lands, like whether it be a wildlife refuge or between two national forests or national forests and national parks. So, it is one of the advantages of it is that it just has this lighter footprint that works real well in a private property area and avoids some of that resentment of um, you know when federal land might be acquired. I might add one other thing while we have some quiet, you still have a couple of minutes, folks, if you want to share what brought you to the session today or have a curiosity you came in with. Um, something really interesting, a little bit of insider knowledge trivia for you is that um, as staff with the National Park Service with Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers here in the Northeast, I actually fall under a division entitled Conservation and Recreation Assistance. And we have a sister program that we call our TCA um, that can provide planning and technical support to all of you and your communities and other types of conservation work. I'd be happy to tell you more about that. But it's a lesser known side of the Park Service and there really is tremendous uh, potential. So if you have other types of projects in your community, but maybe not particular to the river, I'd be happy to chat with you about that too. No outstanding curiosities that we can answer for you? Things you've never understood about wild and scenic? Are there any questions that people came with that perhaps haven't been addressed yet? Or anybody that wants to share what their interest was uh, in the Partnership Rivers? I know I'm always interested in getting feedback about the, the priority that the coalition has for supporting Partnership Rivers. And uh, if people think that we should be doing anything different with that or just keep going on it. Um, happy to get feedback. I would just like to add how happy I am that the coalition is a, a force in advocating for the federal funding uh, and how thankful I am to Alan, Patty, and all the partners here that have helped the Coalition for the Delaware Watershed prioritize the Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers program. As you can tell, it's brought millions of dollars to the ground for conservation projects and projects consistent with the management plan. Uh, this session in general, I was hoping that we would, we would capture what, what that coalition priority means on the ground here in the watershed. I think we've done that. So um, just wanted to add my thanks for all of you and the work that you do in helping to support the partnerships here as a member of the coalition and through our advocacy work in Washington, DC to shake those dollars out of Congress because it really does make a difference. Um, I, you know, I'll take two minutes here just to address uh, Nancy's comment in the chat box around engaging diverse communities um, in having greater access to wild and scenic rivers. That is a conversation happening in pockets across the wild and scenic rivers program. I, I would love to get um, a conversation going with you to hear creative ideas uh, with regard to that. I'm thankful for the sessions that are part of the forum this week um, related to equity and systematic barriers to access um, within the National Park Service as an agency. We're working at it. 
it's uh, when you think of a big institution, an agency as old as the National Park Service, it, is, it can be incredibly slow moving in that respect, but in certain pockets, um, it is moving forward. So um, we only have a few minutes here. And Nancy, I'd encourage you to share some thoughts if you have them. Um, really, it deserves its own session and deep dive into how we can do a better job um, with our own systemic issues, systemic inequality issues um, when it comes to river conservation and watershed issues. It's definitely on my mind. <laughs> Question in the box. Once the designation is granted, are there legal federal, state, or local legal benefits, i.e., are there special water quality protections provided? Yeah. So um, I'll say a couple words and invite my colleagues to also. Legal benefits being a little bit of an awkward term, let me uh, jump to those um, protections provided. When a river is designated, um, the river is protected from the time of designation um, at the conditions of the river at designation to only improve, so to never go backwards in terms of their water quality, free flowing condition, and the state of those um, remarkable values that are named in the management plan. Um, and if anything, to only improve going forward. And so uh, I spoke to the Section 7 review, sort of the regulatory component that the National Park Service is able to provide as part of the act and as part of the designation. Um, though I should mention, we need the municipality to be officially signed on as part of the designation. So Patty spoke a little bit to how we're missing a few municipalities along the Wild and Scenic River. Um, my hands are pretty tied if, uh, if it's not a designated segment. Um, but basically, um, the mandate, as I mentioned, is to protect and enhance. So if there are certain categories of projects, um, I'm allowed to do a technical review with input from the management committee. Um, beyond that, I would say it's, it's the federal funding and the advocacy work of all the partner, um, those are separate things. There's the, <laughs> the work with the federal funding that comes through on projects and programs related to water quality. Um, as well as the advocacy that the council and the partners on the council undertake um, to really improve things in the region. Um, Alan, would you like to say more, Mark? Sure. So one of the things that uh, I think is really interesting about the Wild Scenic River Act, and we just went through this on our river, is that section 12 that we talked about at the beginning about uh, reducing and eliminating pollution on that designated section. So that implies an anti-degradation standard. So if you're familiar with the Clean Water Act, you know, this is a pretty high tier of protection. And in some states, they've taken that to mean this very high level of no new discharge called uh, outstanding natural resource water. In New Jersey, uh, we had a state act, our Coastal Zone Management Act, that automatically granted that status to our coastal wild and scenic rivers. So the Great Egg and the Morris River, but not our inland rivers, like the Lower Delaware and the Musconetcon. But many states, about 18, have done that at some point in time. And that's something that you know, we're interested in from an advocacy perspective. Where the issue came up on a project being reviewed was we were looking at a groundwater discharge sewer system on carbonate rock, which is limestone, which you might know it as sinkholes, and also have things like springs and seeps where the water you know, comes in one way and comes out a different way and then becomes part of the surface water system, part of the Musconetcon River. The Park Service was able to actually comment on this proposed discharge to groundwater because of the impact to the water quality on the river and the potential to negatively impact the trout habitat that we have. It could alter the temperature of the river, for example, or alter the water quality and degrade it. And the authority to comment on that came from that section 12 regarding water quality. It doesn't come up that much, but it's, you know, we're not the only river where this has come up. Uh, one of the federally managed rivers called the Buffalo River in Arkansas, this came up and it was a very significant uh, issue for the park unit there and there's a, a lot written up on that. So if you're really interested in seeing what some of the water quality protections could be with the Wild Scenic River, there's a good case study there. Uh, 
Um, another just quick example here. We I know we only have a few minutes left of um, you know where the act is able to provide water quality protections is um, you know with regard to um, to Hecan Creek in Pennsylvania. I think Patty referenced this and potentially a downgrade of the tributary and um, because the designation is there provides MPS a platform to uh, kind of knock on the state's door and say hey what's going on we should not be moving backwards with regard to any of our water quality standards. So it becomes um, a different kind of conversation agency to agency than sort of local advocacy conversation which is also part of that story. Another question from uh, coming from the chat box. Pennsylvania has a green constitutional amendment. New Jersey is close. New York is leaning that way too. How will a green amendment affect our Delaware River? Anyone want to take that? I, I, I will. Oh, go uh, ahead, Mark. Sorry, as the, well, Sarah as well, but as a Pennsylvania resident, I'm aware that we have a constitutional right to clean air, water, and, and other, you know, quality environment and environmental aspects. Um, I'll just mention that I've watched our Department of Conservation and Natural Resources cite that constitutional authority and how they respond to different issues, whether it's in the Bureau of Forestry or helping to negotiate with uh, the pipeline company wanting to build a new natural gas pipeline across lands owned by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. They take that amendment very seriously and cite it in, in how they approach their relationship with a developer uh, or with some type of land management issue. Um, so I am excited to think that other states are moving in the direction of ensuring that there's a constitutional right that their citizens in that state also are guaranteed access to clean air and clean water. And um, I think we have a long way to go to actually make that a reality. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's what I would add on that topic quickly. Um, Patty and Sarah were both unmuted. So Patty, do you want to add comments there? No, I think that was great, Mark. Um, that was generally what I was thinking. It's just another tool in our tool belt, you know, to add um, some legitimacy to making decisions for that purpose. So I don't know that it's going to change anything in particular, but all the issues that we're advocating for or against <laughs> would have one more reason to cite to justify why the river should be protected. So that's really what Mark was getting at in Pennsylvania. And like he said, in New Jersey, we hope this will happen soon. We've been involved just in sort of the coalition effort in New Jersey trying to get this through. Um, so we're hoping that that will afford some protection in New Jersey as it is in Pennsylvania. All right, we have about two minutes left. Any other lingering questions or closing thoughts? Um, I would love to just reiterate what Mark said. A huge thanks to all of you in the region who do so much for the rivers and for the region. It's an incredible mix of partners at this forum this weekend and uh, being relatively new professionally to the region. I'm a native of Philadelphia, but have been outside the region for some time. I got here in January, just ahead of the pandemic. Um, I look forward to connecting with all of you, as many of you as I can. We're really glad to have Sarah here too for a while. Uh, the river, the Delaware River has been managed from quite a distance in uh, Massachusetts for uh, quite a while now. And it's great to have more local support for from the Park Service for managing it. Uh, also really very grateful to the coalition for uh, and its members for adopting the Partnership Wild Scenic River uh, priority as market indicated. And really glad to share the panel here with our colleagues involved in uh, managing a wild scenic river. It, it, it's a lot of fun and very enjoyable working with so many partners who care about protecting uh, our iconic waters of this region. My closing remark, the Delaware River has more miles of wild and scenic designation than any other comparable sized river in the country. It speaks to all the advocates who fought dump the pump and every other issue like Penn East that keeps coming along. So keep up the hard fights out there and uh, let's keep making sure the river stays clean and, and improves as we move forward. Yeah, you're here, Patty, any concluding remarks? 
Thanks, Mark. I mean, you all said it so well. <laughs> I'm appreciative of the effort too, though, because you can imagine that no one can do this alone. There's so much going on, um, especially in New Jersey. We have so many little municipalities all over. It's really great to have the support of so many really dedicated people and really intelligent and creative people that are coming at this from all different directions, like the Green Amendment. You know, there's just so many ways that we can protect the river. And that's what I love about the partnership is that you get together and figure out what you might not even be thinking of could work, you know? And that's where I'm really appreciative of all your input and support. And Sarah, it is great to have you here after so long without having someone really dedicated to this location. So thanks everybody for joining us today. Yeah, and thank you to, to all of our speakers and, and our moderator, Alan, thank you all so much. All right, well, that concludes the Partnership Wild and Scenic session. Everyone enjoy the rest of the day and please do check out Sketch for, for the rest of the forum sessions happening um, tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. All right, take care, everyone.